Now we're good to go. I well, also, may, I yeah. may have to. You may, may have, have to, to bow out by quarter after, just so you know. If oh, we're not. Okay. Well, we should be done by then. I hope. Well, not that I want to be done early, but uh, I can't imagine we'd take longer than that. Okay. Welcome to Christ the Center, Doctrine for Life, a weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm very pleased to have with me today Josh Walker, who is an MDiv student at RTS Jackson. How are you doing, Josh? Doing all right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you can visit Josh at bringthebooks.org. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware that that website's out there. You can also uh, visit Nicholas Batzig at feedingonchrist.com. He's a church planner in Richmond Hill, Georgia. It's great to have you on, Nick. Thanks, Camden. Thanks for introducing Josh before me. Yes. We also have Jeff Waddington, who's teacher of the congregation at Calvary Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Ringo's, New Jersey. We're very w pleased to have you back with us, Jeff. It's been a little while. Yeah, I'm glad to be back among friends. Yes. And our very special guest today is Guy Prentice Waters, who is associate professor of New Testament at RTS Jackson. It's great to have you back, Guy. Great to be back. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me on. Well, thank you for joining us. This is going to be a, a great little discussion today. We are going to be speaking about church membership. And, Guy, wouldn't you say that church membership actually began um, with Abraham? The, and the concept, I know this brings us to the whole discussion of the visible church, but to the idea of God gathering a people on earth together, separating them from the world, gathering them together as pilgrims together. And uh, historically, I guess it seems in my reading that, that most Reformed theologians and Protestants have understood that to be the beginning of the visible church. Would you, it, would you say that's accurate? Oh, precisely. Uh, the, the church, of course, has been in existence since God first announced his purpose to redeem sinners. And so we, we can see the Church at least inaugurated in Genesis chapter 3, but, but taking form in, in the life of Abraham. And, you know, there you see, uh, as you point out, there's an essential continuity. Uh, God's people are set apart from the world. And uh, Genesis 18, uh, Abraham is to instruct his family members in the ways of the Lord. So the, the church is uh, visibly, it's set apart, and it's to be a school of discipleship. And that's pr precisely what, when we come to the New Testament, we read that the church is to be. Uh, and that's an important argument for saying, uh, yes, we don't have two separate bodies as we move from, from old into new. Rather, we have uh, one people of God across redemptive history, uh, with, of course, adaptations in form, Israel under the old, church under the new, but one essential people. Hmm. And in the administration of God's um, care for his church and overseeing his church, um, in the old covenant, I guess because of the national element and the, the civil sanctions, um, God preserved that, that body through the civil law. In the New Testament, it seems to me at least that it's church discipline, and that's why this issue becomes um, important. You, you've mentioned discipleship, but also church discipline. Obviously, how do you discipline um, someone who's an open, unrepentant, rebellious, you know, flagrant sin when they're not a member of a local congregation. So many people say, you know, I belong to the body of Christ and I, I don't need to be a member of a local congregation. But then there's that element by which Jesus keeps his church from, um, keeps his church pure that, that can't be exercised, right? So that would be, I guess, one of the major elements of why church membership is important. Uh, precisely. And uh, it's, it's helpful to remember, of course, that, that discipline is, is a continuum, and we often think of discipline, of course, in terms of the very tough occasions where a person remains unrepentant in sin, and then right. we have steps that continue uh, per uh, those set out by our Lord in, in Matthew 18. Uh, but, of course, on, on the other end of that continuum is, is the ongoing reading and preaching of the Word, <clears throat> and the uh, life together as fellow Christians and the ongoing admonishment and encouragement and exhortation that, that happens in, in the course of that fellowship, uh, all of this is, is part of discipline. And uh, none of this, of course, is possible if a person is not committed 
uh, to the Church and committed to a group of people as fellow believers in the Church. Uh, that simply can't happen. And if that doesn't happen, it, it just raises many serious questions uh, about the, the life and health of their Christianity. Yeah, and that I think that leads to um, the obvious question. If somebody were to come to you and say, you know, wh- where do we find biblically this idea of church membership, or what are the um, reasons I should become a church membership, that I should become a member of the church, what, what would be some um, lines of reasoning you would give them? Well, I, I would start with the Great Commission. When, when you look at the Great Commission, we, we often think of the Great Commission in terms of evangelism, and correctly so. But if we think of the Great Commission only in terms of evangelism, I think we've missed out on what Jesus is commissioning his church to be and to do. He, he tells the eleven to, to go out into all the world and to make disciples, and then he proceeds to give them two important pieces of information about what making disciples means. Uh, they're they're to, to baptize, and they're to teach men whatsoever he has taught them, all that he has taught them. So certainly the Great Commission and faithfulness to the Great Commission means uh, an ingathering of the saints, the uh, bringing in of the elect to the preaching of the Word as the Spirit uh, blesses that Word to, to their conversion. Uh, But at the same time, the Great Commission, uh, on the terms that Jesus gives us in Matthew 28, doesn't end there. It it begins there, uh, because Jesus is saying that his his people are to be a a body uh, of disciples, and men and women learning and growing in the things that Christ has taught and has has given us through his uh, apostles. So uh, I'd say we start with the Great Commission, you go to the book of Acts next, a uh, perfect illustration of how the Great Commission was actually carried out in the life of the Church. And you see precisely that pattern. Acts chapter 2, the Word is preached, uh, the Spirit blesses. We see evidence of that in the faith and repentance of sinners, and they give expression to that faith and repentance. They join uh, the saints, we're told, in Acts uh, 2.47, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then that same body, of course, that church, as we see in Acts 13, sends others out to do the same. And every place where we see disciples in the book of Acts, uh, they are together, uh, they are under government, a government of Christ's appointment, and it's, it's simply inconceivable as we work our way through Acts and then into the letters which were written to many of the churches that we read about in the book of Acts, it's simply inconceivable to, to think of a free-floating Christian who had made no commitment to the life and fellowship of any particular congregation, who was not under the government of any particular congregation. It's simply inconceivable. And further, when you go into the specific commands of these letters, a lot of them simply can't be obeyed or carried out unless you are a member of a church. How do you submit to those who are in authority over you and who admonish you unless you are in some sort of relationship with them and with the church, uh, signaled by church membership? So I, I would start with an individual who's perhaps skeptical of church membership and and say, look, let's let's look at the uh, course of the church after Pentecost in this age of redemptive history, and and you'll see that there's uh, just no way that we can make sense of the Christian life apart from uh, church membership. And and then you could go uh, the, the route that Nick suggested a moment ago. This is precisely the pattern that God has had with his people in every age in redemptive history. There, there just aren't free-floating atoms out there, but rather God gathers his people together, and they're to live together in relationships of accountability and mutual subjection uh, under the Word, of course. Josh, did you have a follow-up question? I did, and um, there's a move now in evangelicalism to move towards a, um, a virtual church in, in some instances, or doing satellite churches where um, the pastor's sermon will be um, brought in via video and screens and stuff. And I was curious, how does that relate to church membership? And is that a trend that 
is one that we should be in favor